Mr. Deputy Chancellor, it is my, my honor to present to you Brian Cole, distinguished scholar and one of Canada's most prominent behavioral neuroscientists. Brian Cole is a native of Calgary and is professor in the Department of Neuroscience at the University of Lethbridge, where he's been since 1976. He received both a master's, a bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Calgary, a PhD from Pennsylvania State University, and did postdoctoral work at the University of Western Ontario and the Montreal Neurological Institute. His recent work has focused on the development of the prefrontal cortex, how neurons of the cerebral cortex change in response to various developmental factors, such as hormones, experience, stress, drugs, and injury, and how these changes are related to behavior. Brian's remarkable contributions to research and scholarship place him in the highest ranks of Canadian scientists. He has played a key role in the development of science education and the promotion of neuroscience across the country while enhancing Canada's scientific prominence internationally. His work has fueled the search for new treatments for victims of stroke, drug abuse, brain injury, and Alzheimer's disease. Brian Cole has held numerous leadership positions in his field. He was the inaugural director of the Canadian Centre for Behavioural Neuroscience, a remarkable research centre created in 2001 by his group, a group built from meagre beginnings at the time when Lethbridge was largely an undergraduate institution. He is former president of the Canadian Society for Brain, Behavior, and Cognitive Science and recipient of the Hebb Prize. He has a long history of service in Natural Science and Engineering Council of Canada and the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, formerly the Medical Research Council. He's a member of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research Program on Child and Brain Development. Brian Kolb has published five books, including two textbooks with Ian Wishaw, Fundamentals of Human Neuropsychology, sixth edition, and now coming up seventh. Introduction to Brain and Behavior, fourth edition, and over 300 articles and chapters. In addition to his groundbreaking research, Brian is widely recognized for his excellence and enthusiasm in teaching. He has taught at institutions throughout North America, and has been a mentor to countless undergraduate and graduate students, many of whom have gone on to pursue careers in research and teaching. Over the years, he's also given time selflessly to the public dissemination of research findings nationally and internationally. Brian Cole's work on brain development has won him great recognition and numerous awards, including a Killam Fellow from the Canada Council, the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal from the Royal Society of Canada, a Centennial Medal from the province of Alberta, to name only a few. And he is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada Academy of Science. Mr. Deputy Chancellor, on behalf of the Senate and the Board of Governors, it is my privilege and honor to present to you Brian Kolb so that you may confer upon him the degree of Doctor of Science, Honoris Causa.
Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to ask Brian Kolb, Dr. Brian Kolb to make his remarks. Thank you. I want to begin by thanking Concordia for this wonderful honor. I always wonder what it was like to look this direction in Place des Arts, now I know. It's quite a bit different than being out there. As you know, I'm being recognized today for my scientific success, largely uh, for studies on the organization and plasticity of the cerebral cortex. So it follows naturally that I must have had some kind of uh, plan from the beginning, a grand plan of study that I followed through, and it's led me to my discoveries and my standing here. Like most scientists, I went to university for about 10 years, and I must have had a plan. Not really. Uh, one thing you need to know about scientists is that they behave like four-year-olds, uh, sometimes worse. Uh, for example, they constantly ask questions, and according to my wife, it's to the point of being annoying. Um, it bo bothers everybody around them. In addition, scientists engage in activities that appear primarily for their own amusement and often have difficulty verbalizing why they do the experiments they do, why they do the things they do. They just know that it's probably going to be interesting. So there's some lessons here for the graduates, and I'll, I'm going to digress for a second, and then I'll get to those lessons. In, in 1965, which is nearly 50 years ago, um, I was the first person in my family to go to university. Today that would seem surprising, I think, but you have to realize I was born right after the Second World War, one of the first baby boomers, and my parents were not able to go to university. Only, university was only for the wealthy. There was a depression. Things didn't happen. My father, whose career was as an engineer, um, was proud to say he'd gone to the University of Turner Valley. Now, for those of you who aren't from Alberta, you have no idea where that is. Turner Valley was the first big oil strike in Canada. And so he learned engineering from the bottom up and was always frustrated when he was hiring engineers to work for him at Ingersoll Rand that they didn't know anything about engineering. They'd gone to the wrong university. At any rate, he assumed that I would follow in his footsteps and take engineering, and he also assumed that I would play professional football for the uh, Stampeders, as he had done. In fact, I enrolled in pre-law and played on the University Babington team, uh, which was a great disappointment, but luckily he didn't discover it for a while. Like we had a ruse going on that, how, how was the practice today? Oh, it was good. Yeah. Um, at the same time, I had a job at the Calgary Zoo as a uh, short order cook and I was getting the grand sum of $1 an hour. Um, a minimum wage in those days was 85 cents, so I was living high on the hog, and I can recall getting a raise to $1.05 and wondering how I'd spend all this money. <laughs> at any rate, I spent a lot of time at the zoo wandering around and looking at the animals and became really fascinated, so I started taking science courses in my pre-law program. And in fact, um, when I went to graduate to apply to graduate for the BA in psychology, I was informed by the dean that I did not qualify. I had too many science courses. Now, like many of the students here, I didn't really think the calendar was a serious thing, and I would just take what I wanted to take. Um, and I, I was also told by the dean my chances of getting into law were pretty much zero because I hadn't taken courses like political science. No, I hadn't. I didn't even know what it was. Um, so. Luckily, a secretary in the dean's office pulled me aside and, and said, you know, you qualify for BSc. Oh, I'm not sure why the dean didn't tell me that, and I wonder to this day what would have happened if she hadn't pulled me aside. At any rate, I got a BSc. But now what? My mother assumed my degree would lead to a great job. My father was skeptical because it was a degree in psychology, not engineering. A chance encounter with one of my professors, who was the dean of graduate studies, convinced me I should go to graduate school and get a master's, and because of my time studying, uh, studying looking at all the la uh, zoo animals, I thought maybe I'll study animal behavior. So I did, and I decided I would, now this may seem a little odd today, I was going to study the behavior of chipmunks and squirrels. Now at the time, in 1968, it seemed okay. Um, I wasn't really concerned about this being a career. And in the course of trapping the subjects for my study, I got really interested in forests. This was in the Rockies. And I thought, when I'm done my master's in animal behavior, I'll go into forestry. So I went out to UBC and I met with the dean of forestry and said I was keen to be a forester. And he said, not here. 
he said, if students can't make up their mind what they're going to do, we don't want them. <laughs> I was astonished um, at this. And, you know, in, in today's world, a dean would love to have another person in a seat because it's funded by the government. In those days, apparently it didn't matter. Anyway, he said, you're not going to Forestry. So I decided to do a PhD and learn more about the brain, how it controlled the behaviors I was watching. So in 1970, I headed off to Penn State. Now, this was quite an adventure. I'd never been east of the Saskatchewan-Alberta border. There's a town called Alsask, and that was it. And so you have to understand that for those of you who grew up in Montreal and haven't been uh, west of the Ontario-Quebec border, you have no idea how big this country is. At any rate, it was quite an adventure. I had a great time studying the organization of the cerebral cortex. And because the lab had about 250 cats, I spent a lot of time watching these cats. I, I was stu studying uh, rodents, but the cats were really interesting. One thing that really fascinated me was a face that cats make, and maybe you've seen this face. So when they sniff urine, they go like this. <laughs> and I wondered why they did that. So I did my four-year-old thing and started studying how cats do this. Turns out it's called Fleeman, and so I actually was able to write the first paper ever published on this behavior in cats. You may have seen bulls or cows do this, or horses, and you may have seen your pet cat do this when they sniff your shoe. <laughs> I'll let you mull over what that might mean. My actual PhD work was a little more useful. It was on the organization of the frontal lobe. The details aren't very important right now. But I, after completing my PhD, I went to the University of Western Ontario and started studying brain waves, electrophysiology. But one of my colleagues there was studying guinea pigs, and they whistle, and they have all these whistles. So I spent all this time listening to their whistles and started studying whistling and guinea pigs, another useful enterprise for sure. <laughs> so unfortunately, at the end of two years there, it looked like I was unemployable. I was asking a lot of questions, but uh, nobody was prepared to give me a job to pursue that. And so luckily an opportunity arose for me to go to the MNI and study uh, patients with Brenda Milner, and I went. And uh, my mother thought this might be a better enterprise than what I've been doing so far. Now, I loved Montreal and still do, but as a Westerner, I wanted to be back by the Rockies. And an opportunity arose in 1976. The chair of psychology, who'd gone, Roger Barnsley, who'd gone to McGill, uh, asked me if I got a discount in stores in Montreal if I told him I worked at McGill. He said, that prestige is worth a lot, right? And I said, well, well no. And he said, well, here's, here's the, the choice. You can stay at McGill for $12,000 a year and get lots of prestige, or you can come to Lesbridge for $20,000 a year and get no prestige. I concluded prestige was overrated. <laughs> so would my career have been better if I'd stayed at McGill? No, it just would have been different. Uh, besides, I think, and this is important, if you're good, you can do it anywhere. It's a style of life that was really important. We had no facilities, we had little equipment, no graduate students until the 1990s, but like Concordia, we had an administration that was really supportive and wanted the university to become something other uh, than what it was. So nearly 40 years later, as Dr. Stewart mentioned, we built quite a place, and it's a long ways from chipmunks and cat urine. So what's my point? Well, first it should be obvious that I had no plan. Um, no plan at all, it just happened. Secondly, I did not set out 40 years ago to develop strategies for improving the lives of people with brain injury to understand addiction or anything else. This is the nature of what is, we call um, curiosity-driven research. You follow interesting leads and see what you might discover. This is how science works. It's the generation of knowledge. There's a book by David Marsh entitled Knowledge and the Wealth of Nations, and many of the graduates, I hope all of the graduates, will recognize part of that title because it's from Adam Smith's book. Um, the premise of the book is that economic growth is directly tied to knowledge and innovation. It's no accident that the places in the world that have the highest standard of living are those places that have the best universities. Knowledge is a powerful factor in economic growth. Emerging nations like China and India and even Brazil now are building universities at an astonishing rate. Brazil has this amazing program to send students and faculty all over the world for a year or two, gain knowledge, come home, and help them to continue to develop. In 2004, the German government did something that was amazing. They sold the gold reserves and took all that money and plowed it into universities. Germany's doing pretty well. In 2005, France did exactly the same thing. 
the Government of Canada developed uh, the program of Centers of Excellence and CRCs for similar reasons. I have to say, though, that as an aside, post-secondary institution, post-secondary education in Canada is a provincial jurisdiction, and the provinces haven't done as well, and certainly those who live in Quebec know this as well as I do. So get to the message. The goal of universities is to create and dispense knowledge. You've got to get the message to students. You've got to take them as adults and make them think like four-year-olds, to question everything, to question, to question, and to follow uh, the, their interests. Remember, the journey you're starting is like a book, and you don't get to read the last page until you get there. Uh, don't worry about it. You'll get there sooner, sooner or later. You may not follow squirrels or guinea pigs or cat urine, um, but you'll have your own curiosities to follow. Your task is to identify them, to recognize those opportunities, and keep asking questions. Because the questions are the root of knowledge, and it's key for your own success and the success of Canada. Good luck. Dr. Kolb, thank you for your illuminating remarks. I'm certainly glad that you became a neuroscientist versus a lawyer. You'll be pleased to know um, it may be a pre prerequisite for you to be a politician, but you may have to pre-qualify with some surgical experience. There's not much money in it, but it will provide you with uh, lots of prestige for a while. Thank you so much for your remarks.